Every successful person has faced difficulties in their life and career. My guests will share with us the challenges they have overcome on the road to success. Every week we'll follow their story right here in Life with me, Patty Boule. Hello and welcome to Life with me, Patty Boule. My guest today is Lord Pendry. Now, Lord Pendry wanted to be an MP when he was 15 years of age, and his goal was realized when he was in his early 30s, becoming the mem a member of parliament in 1970. As Tom Pendry, he was shadow minister for sport from 1992 to 1997 and was later elevated to the House of Lords. Lord Pendry, you see, being a member of parliament for me seems fraught with problems. <laughs> there were a few, but they were surmountable. Oh, good. You yeah. see, that's what we like to hear on this program. Good. But how do you surmount that amount of problem? It feels to me like being an MP, you're like a dartboard that people throw darts at <laughs> when they're unhappy. I'm good at dodging. <laughs> Well, I, I was a boxer, you, you know. You were a boxer. So, Talking about being yeah, a my boxer. My nose is still straight. It's the <laughs> you don't have a boxer's chin. You know, they're always usually crooked. This is Lord Pendry's book. It's called Taking It on the Chin. Great message because life grabs you. It's always punching you on the chin. Mine is always. But Lord Pendry's book has great messages. And I tell you, it's like who is who in life. <laughs> Pope John Paul, <gasps> Muhammad Ali, name it, Lennox Lewis, all in here. Lord Pendry. You were out of town when I wrote that, you were, otherwise you'd be on it. I was just about to say, you didn't put me in there. I'm not important enough. Uh, the second edition, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, good. You heard it here. I'm holding you to it. <laughs> now, Lord Pendry, quite seriously, you've had certain problems, obviously, as a politician. How do you surmount those problems? I take it on the chin. <laughs> no, sir, and turning the other chin as well. Oh, really? I mean, no, it's, of course, you don't go into this business thinking everybody's going to love you. I mean, mm. at least 20,000 people voted against me when I stood for Parliament in all those elections. So they don't all love you, but they, I think, most respect you if you work hard. That's for interesting, that. because for our listener, your co listeners, you're quite right. Not everyone's going to love you, but they respect you for the hard well, work you, you put in. When I tell you that when I first got elected, I had a majority of 2,000. Mm -hmm. When I left, I had a majority of 15,000. Wow. So I think it does tell you something that yes. you, you actually have put in some hard work for the people you represent. And I must say, it's for most MPs. They get slagged off, whichever party. They don't go into Parliament to be other than... Serve. Uh, yeah, if you like to call it that. Yeah, other than to serve. But you see, serving is not easy. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I, God will be the first person to testify against that. You know, you, we are not easy to serve. You talk here regularly, do you? <laughs> I do, I do. Right. But, you know, we, we're, not, we're not easy to serve. People are not easy to serve. Well, an element, uh, you're right. But um, the majority of people, I think, yes. are nice, decent people in this country. Yeah. And, and uh, certainly I can say that about the people I represented. As I say, they didn't all vote for me. Then didn't all necessarily like me, mm -hmm. but I think they probably admired the fact I put in a lot of effort to please them and to look after their interests. Yes, you know what people say, um, people remember how you make them feel? That is important, isn't it? Like when you're a politician, is the things that you do that relates to them, that made them feel worthy of who they are or made them feel some kind of worth. I think, you know, to me, that's the, unfortunately also, that is the work of the politician, but also sometimes I find politicians can 
make rules. For example, somebody complains, they change the rules for everyone else. I think that's the only part of politics that I think it's so difficult. It's trying to please everyone. You can't do it. Can't do it. No, you can't do it. I think the majority of people, though, believe if you do your best mm -hmm. and you're true to yourself, it rubs off and it's beneficial. That is true. That is true. Now, sports. Sport. Sports. You are amazing in the sports my industry. My mother said you that, had... <laughs> Well, she was right. So I'm seconding your mother here. <laughs> you know, when it comes to sports, you've done so much for the sporting world, for the sporting industry in the UK. You have done a lot. I mean, your book, I was reading your book and the people that you have dealt with, and you had a lot to do with um, the Olympics coming to London. I did, yeah. I don't think that was recognized by too many people. But, no, people uh, never recognize when you do good things. <laughs> but, you know, tell us, it's, yeah. Well, no, I made sure that I, the, there were Olympic uh, bids for Manchester on two occasions. And it just wasn't, as I was a Manchester MP, yes. it wasn't the right place. Because I happen to know that the wives of the, of the Olympic, uh, those who make the judgment, uh, they like where, they're, where the Olympics finish up, where yes. they spend three weeks. They're sick of their husbands going from venue to venue throughout the world, having a great time without them. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew, I knew that Manchester, for all its uh, credits, uh, wasn't up to a capital like London. And so I made sure it went into the manifesto of the Labour Party in 1997, that this would be something we went for. Tony Blair endorsed that. and. As a result, it came to London. That's fantastic, really. And it did so much for London. We, you know, I mean, even the athletes now are still kind of glowing from it. And going from strength to strength, new and more energetic young people coming up. You know, I mean, I was watching, the, um, I think it's the Europeans. And it's amazing the number of gold that Britain is getting. Years ago, it was touch and go. But is it lovely to to hear them? They're, they're great advocates for this country, aren't they? Yes. They, every single one of them, were beaming with you know laughter and joy and, and pride. Yeah, pride. Yeah, pride. Very important. And um, there's something I'm very jealous about. You met Pope John Paul. <laughs> That's right. You met Pope John Paul. Whoa, Saint John Paul. You Absolutely. met a saint. Oops. Well, the only thing I can claim is that my husband and I had special dispensation from him to get married in the Catholic Church. But I wish I had met him. And now he's a saint. <laughs> he's a saint and you met a him. Let me people... just touch you. Let me just touch you. <sighs> okay, that's the blessing come right straight through there. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Lennox Lewis. Yeah. I'd like to talk about... Le you seem quite close to him because you have him at the... Front of your book, you seem to be very fond of him, also. Oh yes, in the a very of lovely man, a great advocate for the sport, yes, and for mankind. He's so good for charities, and he's a lovely person. And I think so many people do not realise that most boxers don't get into trouble because they're well disciplined. Yes, of course. And uh, he's a good classical example of that, and. Uh, no, I'm very proud to have met him, and I'm glad he's on my book. He yeah, did, in the cover. And the cover, but inside there's a, a return match where I'm socking him on the chin. <laughs> the trouble, <It's> there. <laughs> the trouble, trouble is he's smiling. I can't. <laughs> you didn't do a good job there. <laughs> but you were boxing. I mean, you were a boxer once, weren't you? I was, you? yeah. How far did you go with boxing? Well, I, I was a colonial champion. I was a colonial champion of Hong Kong. I won a title in Kuala Lumpur. And then I went up to Oxford and boxed for Oxford University. But it was never, ever going to be my profession. I wanted to be, as you've already said, a member of parliament when I was 15. 15. Yes. Uh, even before that, actually. But um, so therefore, uh, boxing and sport, great. 
just but gives you discipline, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, it's like seeing ballet dancers. The discipline. Oh, I never did that, by the way. <laughs> just put the record I, I, straight. I just, I, my imagination was running wild just <laughs> then. <laughs> now, um, how did you actually finally get into... Okay, you were dreaming at the age of 15 of being an MP. Yeah. How did you... What happened? How did oh, you finally so manage to get Oh, so much luck in this business. I tell you, I was at Oxford University with a, 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 a man called John Roper, an undergraduate. And he came from Hyde and he wanted to be the MP for Stalybridge and Hyde. And out of the blue one day, I got a letter saying their MP was going. And would I like to be considered? So I, being the gentleman I am, you said I, yes. I know, I rang up John Roper and I said, John, isn't, isn't this your seat? Oh, yes, he said, I've got it sewn up, Tom. Be a good experience for you. So I went up and I beat him by two votes. <laughs> now, what? Oh. I tell you. Oh. And, and, and when we Are all, you still friends? And factually, I actually I went to his funeral about oh. uh, two years ago. Okay. But he was a very nice guy. Very nice. You see, that's what I love about he men. Took, he took it on the chin. I you, tell you guys can take it on the chin. You see us women? Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> We're not going to take that line down. <laughs> now, that's, that's, that's really, that was, <laughs> I bet he regretted that, didn't he? No, because he got a better seat. Oh, okay. And well, we there came you in go. at the same time in 1970. They, so. They say when the Lord closes a door, somewhere he opens a window. Yes. Yeah, mine is always a French window. That's what I always ask for. Is Bigger right? than the door, he's closed. Now, you're, um, uh, no, I'm not going to ask because w your answer was funny. But you went to the Benedictines <laughs> 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 because I thought you were a Jesuit. Because last time I saw you, you were speaking with friends about the Jesuits. Yeah, I think I was running them down. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it's a, a good health, <laughs> healthy rivalry between, between these Benedict. two teaching uh, orders. That's right. And uh, the, uh, as I said before, that uh, I didn't know Jesuits were Catholics until I left school. <laughs> <laughs> I was the beginning. I, I just wanted to avoid that sentence. Didn't know Jesuits were Catholics until <laughs> like. That's fair enough, because I didn't know of Jesuits until, because I was in the order of the Holy Child of Jesus. Uh -huh. So I was actually a novit novitiate, okay? And really didn't know about the Jesuits or the Capuchins or the, you know, there were so many orders. I didn't know about them. So you, I, I sympathize there. I quite agree with that. Now, I want to speak to you um, about how you felt if you don't mind, but you don't have to discuss it. When, um, because you were shadow minister for sports, and then when the government came into, you know, um, running the country, and everybody was so upset that you were not made the minister for sports, how did that, how did you get over that and move on? I mean, how did you, because I want young people to understand that a disappointment is not the end of the world. It's very timely what you've said that because just today I've written to Tony Blair. <laughs> really? Why is that timely? Uh, yeah, no, I've written to Tony Blair because the Tory Minister for Sport, the last one, when I didn't get the job, wrote a letter. I've just un unearthed it. I'm a bit of a squirrel, you know. I, I come across <laughs> things. Um, and this letter from the Tory Minister of Sport lamented the fact I hadn't been picked to be the minister and went on an incredible letter. I, I think it's almost unique because that was one thing, you could say how sad he was, but then he went on to tell me how I should get back, giving me advice. Now that's unusual. That is unusual, yes. So, so I've just written to Tony to rub it in a bit. <laughs> You're to <it> today. <laughs> I've they, I was picking up your, you see, I was picking up the vibes yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what would you say to a young person who wants to go into politics today? Because it must be different from when you started. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. it, it is difficult now, more difficult than ever I've known it. It's, it's not a question of the money, although the money is 
very good and people with a lot of talent mm. uh, in other spheres will perhaps prefer to go and make money. Mm. They won't make money uh, in politics. Definitely not. <laughs> but you yes. get a lot of satisfaction yes. by being a parliamentarian. And uh, we've got a lot of, uh, I must say, women in particular coming into politics are shining, very shining at the moment. There's so many good the, women. The, uh, there are many. Um, what do they bring? I mean, because you have seen the time when it was all men, mostly. Yeah. What would you say the women bring to politics? Well, I think they they bring a different aspect of humanity. I mean, they yes. they have gone through things which men have never gone through. I mean, childbearing is one thing, but Precisely. not just that. They've they've come through a lot of discrimination against them, mm -hmm. which is built in over the years. But they're emancipating themselves now. It's not just the suffragettes. I mean, they made a very big contribution to that emancipation yes. but generally now women are coming to the fore in a way they haven't before it, I think I think it's a to me I think it's a good thing but I don't like the notion that they are doing if anybody does it to replace the men then it's just as bad no, no, as the bad it's, it's got to be the equality it's issue got to be you know, it's not just the equality issue. I remember the, I was reading somewhere the Uruguay, Uruguay Indians, um, the women were consulted before they went to war, simply because the women gave birth to the sons that they're sending to war. They had to have women in, in the parliament. I mean, they were ri literally 50-50 because also they felt that women were so close to the soil and the land, they were more or less really life-giving species, you know, side of the species. So they, they till the land, they bring forth the child, therefore they were consulted for in everything that had to do with the tribe. I think that's such a good thing. But then I think sometimes, and it's dying off, thank goodness, feminism took a different turn and became, in my opinion, and I'm saying this on air, more aggressive in its, rather than a more maternal push, which I think what it is. has to be assertive. Be. I don't say about aggressive. I think they have to be assertive. Oh to, yeah, assertive, their, yes, but. To make, yeah. make their voice known, and so I'm all for that. You see, I come from a different place. My mother had nine children. I'm the seventh of nine children. My goodness. And I, she was formidable. Common sense to the... I mean, she was wise. And I think in life, men are logical for good reasons. They are natural hunters, okay? But women have such gifts that they don't know. I know that from my mother. I watched her gift even as a child. And I compared her to my father. And I have to say, she comes up literally 500%. Well, my you know, mother had of, six children. There you go. And she was the dominant one. Mm -hmm. I read that in your book. That's I, why I brought I, it up. My father was a naval officer. Yes. So one would have thought he was the, what, he was the uh, disciplinarian. But no, she was in a very nice way. Precisely. So she made sure that we had manners, mm -hmm. that we were brought up in a better uh, way than some and prepared around. you for the world. Sorry? Prepared you for the world yeah, to come. You know, she was so for proud when I became a member of parliament. Unfortunately, my father died just before. Oh. But uh, she was so proud. And in my book, you'll see her on the terrace at her 90th birthday. I saw her, yes. Um, oh, Mike, yes, she was meeting... Michael Foote. Michael Foote, that's right. I saw her, yes. Strong woman. They were strong yeah, women then, absolutely. and they brought up children. Because you bring up your children, if your child, this is my opinion, I think if my children cannot contribute positively to the world, then I failed. That's how I see it. Not career, not anything else I do. My children, I am the caretaker of the most magnificent souls. 
which the human race is, and that's how I see it. That's my first, that's, that's what I read about your mother from your book. <laughs> Anyway, and I, I've met your daughter, and yes. I know what a good mother you have been to oh, her. Yeah. And she are you says, all listening? And she says it too. <laughs> no, uh, I am, I'm very proud of you. You didn't meet my son. Now, he's a gentleman. Absolute he? fantastic. I, want, I love to meet soul. him. He's, he's a gentleman. Lord Pendry, before we go, I want to talk about Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I met him, I was singing at Henry Cooper's 50th birthday. It was a BBC program, and I just, oh, I loved him. I still have a signature he signed for me, and he was ill at that point. He had Al Alzheimer's? Yeah, yes. something like that. Something yeah. like that, and um, it was, I remember it was 34 years ago. Oh, I'm getting old. <laughs> You'll never be old. Know, but let me tell you how. <laughs> let me tell you yeah. how we met up. Um, uh, he was made the sport personality of the millennium by the BBC, and I went along just as a punt, uh, as an admirer of him. But I was spotted by a friend of his, a former boxing promoter called Jarvis Astaire, okay. and he saw me and he said, "Tom, would you like to come?" I'm, to the Savoy for supper. I'm taking Mohammed mm. and his wife and a friend of theirs. Of course. But then I was sitting down and Jarvis said to Mohammed, did you know Tom was a boxer? My last fight was 40 years before for Oxford <laughs> University. And, and so I dreaded what was going to come next. It did. Mohammed said, show me your left hand. <laughs> I left knew that hand. would happen. Oh. So I thought, I've got to do this. So his wife was to my left, and I got up, and I'm not going to show you now, I'll tell you why. And I went bang, bang, bang. She said, you nearly knocked me out then. And he, however, nodded approval and said, Henry Cooper, because we all know he had a tough fight with Henry yes. Cooper. But what I couldn't tell them, I dislocated my shoulder <laughs> doing it. So the rest of the meal, I would, a fork in my right hand, <laughs> it is not letting on. The next morning, I was at Thomas's hospital getting. Oh, you're kidding! So that was your. You will never forget that, will oh, you? No. Neither will my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> what about Henry Cooper? Did you ever fight anyone coming up to <clears throat> to their that became champion when you were yeah, an aspiring no, boxer? Not champion, but I met people who went on to become good professionals. Yes, but. Um, Henry Cooper was a gentleman too. He was a lovely, lovely man. Yeah. Football. What about football? You're really big into football. Yeah, I, I wanted to be a footballer. And in my book, there's me. I played for Kent Schoolboys, and I was being watched by uh, Fulham, Bolton Wanderers, would you believe, West Ham. And, but I had an injury just oh, wow. before I did my national service. And I'd boxed as well at school and for Ramsgate Boxing Club. So I switched. I had to because I couldn't compete with these budding internationals. Mm. All went into national service between 18 and 21. So I switched and I did quite well at boxing. But football has always been my first love. Oh, I noticed that in the book. And I know all the people you met through football. What team do you support? Derby County. Because you'll see in my book, Brian Clough, the great Brian Clough, yes. was the manager of That's Derby. Right. I was in Derby, living in Derby, when he arrived for the first, and he became a good supporter of mine politically, yes. and it used to help me. And uh, so you were a big supporter of the of the club. Absolutely. But you did a lot for the PFA, didn't you? Because I noticed you were in there with Gordon Taylor as well. Yeah. I got the award by them for what I'd done for soccer. And I'm very, he's a, a lovely guy too, he's a good example of a good administrator. Well, Gordon and, Taylor. And nice, yes. yes, very nice man. Lovely. I met him, yes. Yeah, he is nice. Yeah, no, it's, it, sport has been my life really um, within politics. Uh, everything I've actually done well. <laughs> I think it's been 
in uh, the sporty area. I have been a minister in Northern Ireland. That mm -hmm. was tough. Yes. I've been a minister. Uh, I had this lovely title, Lord Commissioner of the Treasury. In fact, my area, my area they thought I was really the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> if, only, if only they knew I couldn't even do my expenses <laughs> properly. So, uh, no, it's been a very rich life and I'm very pleased I got those two votes to beat my old colleague from Oxford days. I know, but yeah. gosh, you have achieved so much. But I love the fact that you, you really did what you said in the book, take everything on the chin. So you, you don't, a lot of people get bitter and, you know, and twisted about things that happen to them and don't move on. Yeah. But that is one thing that I've taken away from interviewing you. It really is take it on the chin because life would throw many things at you. I, I mentioned about this letter I've just written to Tony Blair. You've got <laughs> yes. it before anybody. But I do finish up by saying, you will know I'm one of your staunchest supporters. Oh. And yeah, I, it will remain so. Because I think that he will be remembered for one, without mentioning it, one item in, in, in his uh, in days as, as Prime Minister, but he did so many good things. He did, which yes. Which people tend to forget. Oh, well, people forget the ba That's good right. things and remember the bad things. That's the thing with life. Lord Pendry, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you for being my guest today. It's been lovely meeting you and <laughs> talking to you like this. <laughs> thank you so much. It's wonderful having you. Thank you. And my thought for you today is to do with what Lord Pendry has said. Okay, you take it on the chin. You see, life is not easy. It's going to get difficult. It's, you're going to have disappointments. We, we, we all go through this. But you see, what comes easy doesn't last for very long. It's the difficult things that you've had to work hard for that makes you so proud. And when you have disappointments, just take it on the chin like Lord Pendry says and just move on. The best is yet to come. We'll see you next week.